Good evening, folks. What do we call ourselves? The few, the proud, the Baptist. <laughs> Sounds okay. But we're going to go ahead and remain seated and sing How Firm a Foundation, 268. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said to you? Jesus have fled when through the deep waters I called thee to go the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow for I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Thank you, Brother Steve. Thank you, Caleb. That's a great song. Good to see you this evening. Those who have come to join us, I have a whole stack of beautiful bulletins left over from this morning. I wish folks could uh, have one. It's a beautiful bulletin. Got a lot of uh, good things in it. We're going to share in just a few moments one of them. But um, in particular, just to mention as we begin, uh, the services are open here for folks who'd like to come in and join us uh, Sunday morning at, uh, for 11 o'clock service, Sunday night, 6 o'clock. And then uh, Wednesday night, Bible study, 7 o'clock. We'll continue streaming the services at, at this time till the 1st of June when hopefully we'll be able to have Sunday school and everything uh, able to begin in, in earnest. Uh, but for each and everyone that's joined us with us here this evening, I appreciate you coming in this direction, even folks uh, coming on in now. So that, that's great to see. Um, I've trying to, been trying to visit most of the young folks on the van route and so like that and let, keeping them informed and in contact to get ready for uh, June and uh, to spread the news about the youth camp, the Wilds Youth Camp that we've had to, well, it was from the camp that they had to cancel the first three weeks at the Wilds in North Carolina, and, but they moved our camp week back to July 27th through August 1st. And Lord willing, we'll be uh, good to go for everyone who can still attend with us on that week, the Wilds Youth Camp. Uh, still still doing good, I think, with everyone to, uh, on the services. Uh, children's Church, uh, well, I don't think it's ch called Children's Church anymore. Uh, Layla officially announced in nursery that she's going to baby church, and she left the nursery and went over to the next room. So, um, so what we're doing is promoting ourselves around here now and moving ourselves up. When you come back, you just go what class you want to and call it whatever name you want to. You just go to that class. So... That, that'll work out good. Um, we're trying to uh, keep the nursery and um, children's church area and all that stuff all especially uh, clean and good, safe for folks to use. Um, I think it's awkward coming to church and not being able to shake anybody's hand. Everybody just kind of looks at each other, gives a little nod of the head and may, maybe a, a little bit of a kind of act like you're going to pump and hit somebody, but you just kind of got to draw back from that. But uh, that's the way. That's just the way it'll have to be. Our offering plates are on the back communion table, and we don't pass the offering plates there. And Lord willing, when you come in on Sunday morning, there'll be some lovely young ladies that'll greet you and uh, give you a bulletin, ha even have the door for you. Well, I can't keep up with it now, but uh, now that uh, Brother Bill East has had his first special, and I heard all the comments after the service, uh, well, we got us a folk hero now, 
And so he'll have to get a second special ready. It took him 50 years to get that one. Maybe we can get another one from Brother Bill. And uh, I believe Brother Larry Martin's become quite a hero, folks, too, because he got the sword of the Lord, and, and he just decided he wanted to read some of it in the morning service here this morning. So folks who don't know that was the sword of the Lord thought, what, who's that gentleman over there reading the newspaper? So, so Larry, if you're here, you would be surprised how many texts went around through the service this morning about you. So anyways, I, I do appreciate it you know, that folks had come, make themselves at home. I guess I'm kind of casual tonight without, without a coat, so you, you must know you're in for quite a message if I'm not wearing a coat because I know that you are because I had it on the back picnic table today. I thought I'd read it out there and then I just kind of let it go and the wind took it and flew it all over the yard. So na the neighbors down there having a party saw me chasing sermon notes through the, through the backyard. So, And uh, we'll see what order it ends up being tonight. It could be good. But anyways, glad to have you here. I had special prayer requests. Remember Brother Landon Moorhead. Remember Brenda Babcock. That's Brother Wayne Fink's sister. Had uh, some cancer surgery. Going to need some treatments. And then a special prayer request for... Um, uh, ben and Beth Schrader, and I'll just say it that way, special prayer request. And if some of you would like to know what that is, and go ahead and text Miss Tammy, and she will let you know what we're praying for tonight and a special need there. So I'll just put it that way because I would like for people to pray for a very special need there, some, something that needs to happen this week, Lord willing, hopefully. Let's open with a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessings, and we'll be turning to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you in prayer. We're grateful we may come. I say it hastily, but I know your throne is sacred. And I know that above all others, you're faithful and true, righteous altogether. May your name be lifted up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for a special prayer request. Pray for Brother Wayne's sister to be healed. Pray for Brother Landon for strength at this time. And I pray for Ben and Beth Schrader tonight. Lord, you bless them and meet their special need. Dear Father, I pray that you bless as we study your word. May your Holy Spirit, for folks that are gathered at home or here in the auditorium, may your Holy Spirit meet with us and bless, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, turn with me to Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter 8. And I hope you'll best bear with me. The, the last couple weeks we've had passages out of Daniel, and we will, Lord willing, tonight, and Lord willing, next Sunday morning. Wednesday night, especially the dear gentleman and family that asked me specifically on the topic that can a saved person ever be lost, I hope you'll stay with us for the next several Wednesday nights. I wish I could jump to the end so you can know where we're headed, but we're building a foundation this last Wednesday night. There's four impossibilities listed in the book of Hebrews, four impossibilities. The first one is foundation. It is impossible for God to lie says so to himself. So um, building on that foundation, what God has promised and where we stand in salvation, um, continue to build on that. We'll have two more of the impossibilities before we get to the fourth one. Two more this coming Wednesday night. Daniel chapter 8, let me get there now. Have it marked. Verse number 23. And in the latter time of their... And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding darts, dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, could be said awesomely or terrifyingly, and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, economy. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of pr princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and of the morning which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward I rose up and did the king's business 
And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. This passage we're on is one of four in, in the book of Daniel that has to deal with the end times. It has to deal with Daniel's, God's timeline for the house of Israel. And in particular, Daniel's 70th week. And in that 70th week, the Antichrist, this man of sin who will be ruling and reigning over this world at that time. I just use that not to go to any specific details on that tonight, though we read some of them, to show you how serious the book of Daniel is and how serious the lesson, the visions which Daniel received are. Could I say, um, before we get to the very beginning, here's some reasons we know these are special lessons in the book of Daniel. Number one, the visions were interpreted and answers were given by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Whoever could even think of having personal answers to prayer hand-delivered to you by Gabriel himself. That gives you an idea or an indication how, how special the visions were and how meaningful they would be. Three times Daniel is called or addressed by this angel as greatly beloved. I know in the New Testament there's passages in the epistles where it says now dearly beloved or beloved. Daniel is addressed with an answer to prayer or by the angel Gabriel as greatly beloved. It's in Daniel chapter 9 verse 23. It's in Daniel chapter 10 verse 11 and Daniel chapter 10 verse 19. Three times he's addressed by Gabriel as greatly beloved. But if anything, I should say this, we get an idea how serious these messages are and what's about to happen even with the persecution of the, of the Jewish people. That Daniel's considered one of the big three in the Old Testament. And that estimation is not by me, that estimation is by the Holy Scriptures. What do you mean the big three? Would that be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. As far as in specific times, of Israel's history of great trial and conflict. Daniel's one of those three. I'm going to turn back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14. I believe that's it, Ezekiel 14. We've got to go back to this one book. Ezekiel 14 and verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. At the time of Israel's great apostasy and falling away from God and going into false idols and, and unbelief, and Ezekiel, a prophet of God, says, if three, three men existed at this time of the judgment that's going to fall on Israel, they couldn't save it. Uh, I think the other passage, if we go on down to it, is just down in verse 20. It says, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither <coughs> son nor daughter. That's a pretty close relation. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. And I've mentioned this before, but I'm coming back to just again to refresh our memory. Noah lived in a time that was so wicked that God judged the entire world with a great flood. And it repented God that he made man. That's how wicked it was in Noah's day. He was through with it. My spirit shall no longer strive with man. But Noah found grace, and Noah was able to bring his wife. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He was, allowed to bring, he, he was able to get them. And those three sons were married, and he was able to bring their wives, and eight souls were saved. Now we come to Job. And we realize that Job went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, face to face with Satan himself. I can't even stress again, but I've said it before, so I'll bring it out again. I don't think any of us have ever experienced that, the temptation and the pressure and the actual conflict of, though we wrestle against princes and powers and principalities and in spiritual places, and we do spiritual battle, every one of us, I doubt, I doubt that any of us have had to face Satan himself in a conflict. I don't even know if we could even speak or 
think of how deceiving that would be, then how uh, detrimental and how destructive that be, would be, and how we would even, how much spiritual armor we'd have to have on to even be able to withstand the fiery darts that Satan himself could throw at us. But he came straight at Job. And Job is restored at the end of the book of Job. When he prayed for his friends, he prayed, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job, and Job saw victory. Job came through. He didn't curse God. Lost the ridiculed by all the religious order of his own friends, and then plus one, and uh, Satan himself. And God spoke to Job and gave him an answer. I'm, I'm in charge of things, don't worry. Job came through. So I'm just saying that. Those are some high, that's some lofty company to be thrown in the righteousness of, of Noah and thrown in the righteousness of Job. Well, who else in the scriptures has that? Daniel. Angel Gabriel comes to give him the visions, interpretations. Three times he's called greatly beloved. And on top of all that, he's included in the big three of a righteous man. And don't we know that the scriptures say the prayers of a righteous man availeth much? Won't we find Daniel praying in just uh, tonight or in the Sunday? Well, the issues of his day were big. Issues of our day are big. I did most of my preaching before the service, just talking with a few folks, and sometimes I have a little more liberty there and not in the pulpit when I'm just saying some of the things I might personally think. But I'm tired of preachers whining and complaining how tough they have it. Oh, the burden I bear. And preachers, you know, say, it's a tough times, man. We're, we're preaching in empty auditoriums, and we've, we've had to go to streaming. Oh, buck up and do your job. I figure it can come on preachers hard. Is that okay? If you're listening out there. Now, I want to say it to a lot of other professions, too. Um, years ago, <clears throat> years ago, we had a requirement in college that we had to run a bus route for one year in Chicago. And I was trying to work my way through college, so I was working the third shift. And, and then we had a requirement of having eight hours of visitation in for the church. So I'd get off work at the second, third shift on Friday night, and then I'd go to my eight hours of required visitation in the bus route, and then I'd come back that, work my third shift on Saturday night, and then get my bus route on Sunday morning, and I'd come back, and the missus knows this, I'd find a men's restroom and go in the, in the stall, and I'd go to sleep. Well, on a big day, we were supposed to have record numbers on our bus and pulled in with 72 kids on my bus. I was dead tired. I was disappointed. I go with 75. I had 72. Pulled in, opened the door, and the bus director stepped on the bus, and he just happened to be a Special Forces ex-Green Beret. He said, how's it going, son? I said, man, it's tough. What do you mean it's tough? I said, oh, I ain't got no sleep. I got three kids on the bus, I believe are sick, need to go home, and I didn't make my goal. Man, it's so tough. He said, it's tough. He said, son, I've laid on my belly in Cambodia in a, in a jungle 20 miles from the beach, 12 hours from getting on a submarine to meet me back home, and 3,000 communists between me and the beach, and my porter backed off and ran away from me, and the only thing behind me was a Bengal tiger. He said, now, son, that's tough. You get a different definition of what's tough. So I'm saying to all the preachers, quit whining. There's tougher things that we face than this. There's generations that went, you just, you just read, there's generations that went through abject poverty. Compounded with the Spanish influenza. And compounded with uh, one out of every eight families losing someone in the war, the Great War. One out of eight. And no jobs. Now that's tough. And uh, to some of this, I don't know where it's all going. So I'm going to go back and forth on this. I don't know where all it's going. Are we being driven from or to globalization? I've read both ways. I really don't know. I think when it's all said and done, it's towards. It may not look that way, but there's coming a world leader. That I know is biblical. So I believe in the long run, it's driving us towards globalization. 
There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be some end time wars. Even the Antichrist comes on the scene. And there's out of ten nations, the, the ten horns of the last kingdom, three of them he subdues by war. There's going to be a nation against nation at the end. I'm going to believe that's going to be large, big. There's going to be the effects on, on the economy. There's going to be food shortages. And it's not going to be panic runs on toilet paper. There's going to be actually food shortages. You're going to have to take the mark of the beast to buy and sell. Do you think there's some indication? Yes, I do. Folks ask me, but I don't get real specific because I might not know any more than you. But yeah, there is something about being, being able to be facial recognition. There is something about being able to be cashless and be, be some, type of, some type of purchase system. There's got to be something to this fact that you can't come into this building, go in that store, or you can't purchase or go in that schoolroom unless you've had a certain vaccination. You're going to have to be marked somehow. Is all this heading that way? Seems that way. The specifics of it, the economy is going to have to be really controlled. And if you just think, if think it through that with this, this control of how much you can travel and where you can travel, if you have rental property, whether you can open it or not and rent it out, even though the person is renting it, it's going to completely stay by themselves, you can't rent it. To continue on with that, just, just, and there's thoughts of that, to be able to be, for the government to determine whether you are essential or not. Folks that, now I am an amateur historian, but I have read enough of 1930, 1931 to 1938 to realize that when a government, an imperialistic government, tells people who's needed and who's not and who can work where, that is very dangerous ground. I'm just telling you. And I'm trying to preach as they come to the seriousness of the gravity of our faith. Daniel experienced a time when we go back to Daniel chapter 1 that uh, he, he's going to have to change his name. There's going to be a registration. It's an identification program. And his name's going to be now identified with Babylon. And not only is he going to lose his, his, his Hebrew name and receive a Babylonian name, he's going to, he's going to learn a new language. And with that new language, he's going to have to have... Uh, uh, be edu have a new diet. Everything about his culture is changing. So on that note, if possible, I'm going to try and bring something up. It's just something you ought to see because this is not a mystery. I can play this one because it's public domain. And since it was put on public domain, it's only a minute long. I can play it. Folks, there is something going on. Here's what I'm trying to say. There's something going on. It's, it, it may seem serious now. It'll be more serious later. The time now, like from, a, from the U.S. House of Representatives, the open publication, now's the time to turn America Muslim. Let's see if we can watch it. I'll step aside. Education is one of the most important areas that Muslims have to address. And while our objective, our final objective, is not just to become part of the system that we experience now and that we see, our objective, our final objective, is to create our own Islamic systems, and not only create Islamic systems for Muslims, but to look at all the other people who are sharing this country with us as potential Muslims. And if we look at them as potential Muslims and feel that we have the obligation which Allah has told us to try to bring them into the same style of thinking, into the same uh, way of behaving, into the same objectives that we have, then we have to have some way that we can communicate with them and some way we can work with them. And in that long-range process of making America Muslim, all of America Muslim, then we have to have some actual short-range goals. We have to have some way of dealing with them and know how we're going to deal with them and in which ways and be very calculated about it, or else we will not accomplish our goals. Thanks, Mark. Well, if you could see that halfway decent home, that was on C-SPAN on last Saturday. So it's not, it's not hidden. It's, it's like I say, that makes it public domain. So maybe you've seen that. You realize there's some groups that realize now's the time 
Not to make some people, but to make America Muslim. That's from U.S. House of Representatives. So things are changing. Things are different. Um, I don't have to read the National Enquirer to see that there's African hornets that are invading that can sting and kill people. That the president had to direct the U.S. military to be prepared for the electronic impulse bomb surge to bring down our entire power grid last week. That China has introduced a nuclear stealth bomber that can reach the American mainland from China. Well, that's great to know. That Planet X, in its passage, which is normal, could have a magnetic field to raise the, the coastline waters a couple feet. Well, that's good to know. That airline, auto, and the travel industries are devastated right now, and on all three of them on the brink of, of bankruptcy. And then it was announced that artificial intelligence or, or, vit, or virtual education will take over public education by, in the next 20 years. Does that sound all like good news? Well, it doesn't to me either. You had enough of it? I think I have. I just say that in speaking to say this. Look at Daniel 7, verse 25. Watch Daniel's response to his visions, or the visions that God interprets. Watch, there's it's four of them, so watch what takes place. Daniel 7, verse 25. If you stayed with me this far, let's see if we can end up some some good news Positive thoughts from God's words. Daniel 7, verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. See, it's back that vision of the Antichrist. Three and a half years, he's going to change the world. He's even going to change the time for his own. I believe he's going to try and set, set the new calendar by his birth, just like Christ. But that being said, it's a vision of Christ. But the judgment, let's see, let's, let's just jump down to verse 28. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cognitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. The first revelation of the Antichrist, Daniel said, man, this changed my face. This much troubled me. Daniel chapter 8, verse 27, it says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Before Daniel could go back to work, work and do the king's business, which he served, when he got the vision of the Antichrist and more about him, Daniel said, And I fainted. How about these responses? Does this show you the gravity of what was being revealed to Daniel now? Look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 8. And behold, and hand touched me, which set me on my knees and upon the palms of my hands. <laughs> well, why, do, why does it have to do that? Verse 9, verse 9 says, And I was in a deep sleep on my face and my face towards the ground. Daniel was unconscious with the message he received. It knocked him out. Had an angel have to help him back up on his hands and knees. Let's go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 16. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I retain no strength. Now I just wanted to go through those. Those are mentioned in Daniel, and a lot of times they're just bypassed. Because the visions and the revelations that Daniel received of what was coming to Israel... Took the smile off his face, changed his countenance, troubled his heart, knocked him down, had to have an angel help him up. The gravity of our faith. Should I say number one, Daniel chapter one, verse eight, and I hope that you'll bear with me. It'll be very similar, but Lord willing, we'll come back to another side of this on, on Sunday. Daniel 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. You remember young people on Palm Sunday said, when youth get it right, and Daniel was a youth that got it right, he made a decision and purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Daniel was committed to his heritage. 
That's why I showed you these things tonight. That's why in particular, if I can find a copy of this, of this morning's bulletin where I put them all, that's why there's such things in the bulletin that says, the deterioration of every government begins with the decay of the principles on which it was founded. C.D. Montecu. John Jay, first Supreme Court Justice of the United States. It is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. How would you like your first Supreme Court Justice to say that today? Well, I just think there's several others in here. Uh, let's see. Upon being presented with the Bible, Abraham Lincoln replied on September 7th, 1864, in regard to this great book, I have but to say, it is the best gift God has given to man. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it we could not know right from wrong. All things most desirable for man's welfare, here and hereafter, are to be found portrayed in it. That's a good statement from a president, isn't it? I read in this book, on this continent, we should never forget that man first crossed the Atlantic not to find soil for their plows, but to secure liberty for their souls. Robert J. McCracken. I could go on and on with these. I just thought it was interesting what Thomas Jefferson said when asked what he thought of George Washington. His integrity was most pure. His justice the most inflexible I have ever known. No motives or interest or consanguinity of friendship or hatred being able to bias his decision. He was indeed in every sense of the words a wise, a good, and a great man. Perhaps the strongest feature of his character was his prudence. Never acting until every circumstance, every consideration was maturely weighed. Refraining if he saw a doubt. But when once decided, going through with his purpose, whatever obstacles opposed. The reason to read such a thing as that is because even the other great founding father could say of another, that is a good and de decent, honest man. Wouldn't you like that to be said of all our politicians? I come back to this to say this, no matter how serious the situations. No matter how much the times, I'm repeating from the message on Mother's Day and this morning where Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, knowing assuredly of whom thou learned them. The scriptures that were able to make thee wise in the salvation. I'm saying to folks, no matter what the times, don't forget your American heritage and don't forget your spiritual heritage. And if I had to put them in order priority, don't forget your spiritual heritage first. Daniel said, I would like to eat the same diet that I had in Jerusalem. I would like to live the same manner of life that I had that my, my deceased and passed away mother and grandmother and father and grandmother and everyone else. I want to stick with that. I mentioned that one, the personal events of Daniel's tragic times and perilous times, don't forget to um, your heritage. Number two, don't forget, stay committed <clears throat> to the honor of the Lord first. When I read this morning, but seek ye first, I'm tying message together, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, the three Hebrew children, don't know which one was speaking for the three boys. They're, they're Babylonian names we know of, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, I know as they stand before the, the enraged king and all those jealous counselors that wanted him to bow down to that image of Nebuchadnezzar, they said, you can start your music a second time. So they didn't do it the first time. You can start your music a second time, but we're still not bowing down. Now, what they faced was a burning, fiery furnace. I've seen the kilns that are over in McDowell County or the, the coke where they used to, where used to burn in and so like that. And I can just imagine as I saw some of those built into the hillsides and how they had an open front to them and they'd stroke the heat and get it up in those furnaces. I can imagine them seeing such a kiln in Babylon and where they could see the entrance and the fire roaring inside. Now they either you bow down or you go in there. And they say you can start your music a second time. I'm not going to the passages now for time, but go ahead and start it. But we will not bow down for the Lord God whom we serve. He's able to deliver us. But if not... We still not bow. 
Now, I've said this before, so it's worth repeating, come back to this. What are they practicing? What are they adhering to? What are they committed to? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. They know who their God is. And though he is unseen and he's a spirit, they know who their God is. What's commandment number two? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And they know what something else when someone fashions or forms another image of God. Or something to be bowed down and worshipped to. And here's one in front of them. And they know that's commandment number two. They continue to read this. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generation. And thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord God in vain. They know commandment number one, number two, number three, and number four. And they're sticking to it. The gravity of their faith. Then Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. So I'm going to say this. Remember in the times of perilous times, don't forget your heritage, spiritual and American. Number two, remember who you're honoring is first and foremost in your life. Huh? The world's going to be setting up all kinds of graven images in front of you. Remember who your honor goes to first. Number three, be committed or... Keep before you that blessed hope. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, I can just touch on tonight, come back more to, are you serious, on, next, on the Sunday morning. Daniel 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what writing? If you don't spend the next 30 days asking your request, making your prayers to Darius instead of any other gods, <clears throat> lion's den. Capital punishment. When Daniel knew that it was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. These men, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Well, they were laying, lying in wait. They knew that was his practice. When the right lighting, writing was signed, they went to make, see if he'd do it. And he did. I realize in the time, because Daniel's going to say something, though it's in a later chapter, he puts the time frame in the first year of Darius, so we know that this go back. So I'm going to read something in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Well, I'm sorry, verse, chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by, by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So in this time frame of Darius and this edict and all this, we realize Daniel had been reading something. What he had been reading. He's been reading Jeremiah's letters. We call it the book of Jeremiah. What did he read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verse 10? What did he read in chapter 29? I believe somewhere around verse 15. What did he read in Jeremiah's book? That the Lord would accomplish 70 years in the Babylonian captivity. Do you know what Daniel's doing at this latter stage of his life? He's believing the scriptures. He's believing in just two verses what Jeremiah wrote, inspired of God, that they were going home from Babylon. Daniel's thinking of the years that he had served and been captive and served under Nebuchadnezzar's reign, then the Medes and the Persians, and now he's in the first year of Darius. And you know what Daniel's thinking? It's a whole lot closer to us going home than when I got here. That's what he's thinking. And he's made a promise to God's people in the scriptures that Jerusalem is where they're going to be going. They're going home. And I know the promise of God's scriptures that to, to the saints. Some generation, and I believe in an indication of the scriptures, even in the book of Daniel when he talks about the iniquity or the cup or the time being about full. Sometime, my friend, the church age, 
the, the, the members, the body of Christ is going to be full. And sometimes the iniquity of this world is going to be full. And when both of those are filled up, Jesus is coming again. How do I know that? Scripture says so. And I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. I don't know if it's next week, next month. But I'm saying, read these things that be a message. It seems like it's a lot closer than it ever was before. And I want to have this. No matter what the devil throws at us these times, I want to have, I want to be still committed to that blessed hope. I don't want to forget my heritage. I want to know who I'm honoring first in my life. And I want to keep my hope in Jesus alive. Amen. How serious is it? I'd look, I wanted to look it back up. I had a copy down. Probably share it again next week in a little more detail, but I'll use it tonight in closing. On April 20th, 1999, not that long ago, Eric Harris and Dylan Kleibold got some propane tanks from some heaters, some gas stoves, several pistols, couple rifles, and dressed in black, later confirmed by confiscation of many things in their home, they were deep into the occult and Satanist. As soon as they say this, you know what I'm talking about. They went to Columbine High School, and at not about 9.20 in the morning, they began to open fire. They never worked their way to where they stashed those propane tanks to set them off where they thought they could do the most damage and reach the most people. But within 10 minutes, they killed 12 people. And then a 13th with a teacher. Then eventually they'd commit suicide. But in there, the testimony of the folks in the cafeteria, I believe it was the one that was named Eric Harris, went to a table where a young lady was crouched down behind an overturned table sideways turntable, put his pistol into the forehead of a little girl named Cassie and asked one question, are you a Christian? And as the title of the book and eventually a documentary movie and a testimony before the U.S. Senate, the witnesses said she simply said yes. And they ended her life. Now, folks, that's a hero. That's someone in a serious time remembered who her life was to honor, remembered her heritage, remembered her, who to honor and who was number one, and what her hope was, whether life was going to end or not, her blessed hope is still heaven. Now, isn't that inspiring? Don't you wish we'd have the courage of that? Don't you believe times like this uh, are times where folks ought to, again, uh, be committed and know the gravity of their faith? Let's close the word of prayer. Holy Fathers, we come to you in prayer. Holy you are. Help us with our special prayer request, dear Father. We'll just turn it completely over to your hands, the special needs. Bless the church this week. When we give again to see the people in these perilous times finding themselves to, the, to God's house, Lord, we pray. And dear Father, I pray that we thank you for our heritage. Lord, let us not surrender it so quick. Lord, let us not surrender it so quickly. Dear Father, I pray that you will bless as we look towards the Lord's day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you. Thanks for coming this evening. If you're out there somewhere, Lord bless you.